How do we have a group of people, a staff, or a group of leaders that are working with each other to help move an agenda or a mission forward together in person? And so in the day and age that we're in, giving our mobility, given how things have expanded, given even our social media culture with um, influencers growing and that that edge. It is is much more difficult to have a group or um, people, a community, a structure around you to help move things forward. And so I'm noticing even more than um, what I had when I was first starting ministry, that leaders really are pulling pulling the load alone, pulling the load alone and feeling like there is no one um, to connect with. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Pivot Podcast, where we explore how the church can faithfully navigate a changing world. I am Alicia Granholm and joined by co-host Dwight Shiley. Here at Luther Seminary's Faith Lead, we see four key pivots the church should make here in the 21st century to address some of the challenges and opportunities facing it. And the first is a pivot in posture from trying to focus on fixing institutional problems to a posture of listening, discerning, and um, following where God's leading. The second is a pivot in focus from membership to discipleship. The third is a pivot in structure from one shape or one size fits all approaches to church to a mixed ecology of lots of different forms of Christian community reaching lots of different kinds of people. And the fourth is a pivot in leadership from primarily clergy-led lay-supported ministry to primarily lay-led clergy-supported ministry. That's right, Dwight. And that is why we are very excited to welcome the Reverend Nicole Bullock to the show today. Nicole is the founding pastor of Blue Oaks Church and consultant with nonprofit organizations and church leaders. Nicole is also the program director for our Seeds Fellowship for Ministry Innovators here at Luther Seminary's Faith Lead. As an expert in innovative ministry approaches, we knew that we really wanted to have Nicole on the podcast because we see the church being invited um, to a couple pivots. One is posture and being really spiritually rooted enough to listen and discern where God is leading, as well as in its structure and moving from this one-size-fits-all model of ministry to a mixed ecology. And as we're seeing it, these are both sources of burnout actually taking place today, especially for clergy. So we are really excited to have Nicole on the show. Nicole, welcome. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. Excited to be here. So Nicole, um, tell our audience a bit about yourself, your story, and your journey in ministry. Uh, it's almost like, where do I begin? Uh, but I'll I'll start it uh, when I was born. Um, just kidding, guys. Uh, but I've been in ministry uh, since college, really, is when I initially felt a really strong call to ministry, specifically pastoral ministry. And um, I just kind of followed the trajectory from that point. And my first ministry experiences were youth pastor, associate pastor, and then eventually it pivoted you know, skipping lots of steps in my story, but eventually it uh, pivoted to planting a church in the Twin Cities called Blue Oaks Church. And I did that for about 15 years. And so that was an exciting journey. Um, we kind of got, you know, as many churches did, um, a little disrupted, if we want to say that, that's an understatement, um, by COVID and did some things online and eventually fully transitioned, but um, my ministry experience from getting started, planting a church, leading, uh, leading as a woman, leading as a woman of color, then leading through COVID uh, has given me lots of opportunities to grow <laughs> and also just lots of experience. And so I've now pivoted uh, most of what I do to training, equipping uh, church leaders and other nonprofit professionals and helping them navigate these waters. Nicole, can you share with us a little bit more about really that experience of uh, planting a new church and um, what that was like and some of the uh, learnings that you 
maybe, you know, some of the top learnings that you took away from from be, a founding pastor, right, as well as um, kind of living into the, some of the different stages of a new ministry? So from that experience and, and just getting a church started, I will say like many, many church planters, I was enthusiastic, I was passionate, and it was great. And I had a church planning coach that my denomination assigned to me at the time. And I was so eager because we had a progressive plan where you start with preview services is what we call them. So you move from like um, having meetings in your home, small Bible studies, preview services, and then every Sunday. And so as a new church planner, I was chomping at the bit. I was ready to get these things done. I'm ready for every Sunday. And my church planning coach told me, he said, Nicole, once you get started with every Sunday, it is is really exhausting. It can be tiring. So take your time, really prepare and get ready for that. And I thought to myself, I got this. You know, I'm passionate. I'm called. Let's do this. And um, looking back at it, uh, I do wish I would have spent more time carefully preparing for all the dynamics that would shift in leadership with moving to a weekly service. Things like um, assigning tasks, creating boundaries, doing self-care, things that you don't quite get to do in the process leading up or think about. Um, I definitely would have spent more time doing that uh, because once you do start the Sunday rhythm, you are focused on the Sunday rhythm. And so, yeah, so that's a little bit of my story of how I got started and what it was like once I got in. It was definitely exciting. Absolutely loved it. But I will say in retrospect, I didn't have the most sustainable practices in place that would help me to do the work I was doing. So Nicole, tell us a little bit more about the context of Blue Oaks Church. Like what what kind of neighborhood was it planted in and what kind of people did it draw and what did you learn about kind of being in mission um, in this time leading up to the pandemic, at least um, in, in that context? Well, we I am originally from uh, Chicago, born and raised actual city. So that's important for Chicagoans who claim like Chicago. We like to say we're from the city. And the reason why that's important for me is because I wanted to do urban ministry. I wanted to be in the city when we relocated uh, to Minnesota. So I was in seminary and I transitioned to Minnesota to plant a church. And so immediately I knew I wanted to plant in or near the city. And so for me, when I got started, I actually started working. My background is in social work. And so I got a job at a community center, um, which was literally located right behind my house. And so I would walk to work every day And I was over their youth program and I had this great opportunity to minister to, to talk with youth and their families. And I also worked at a church at the same time. So there was this beautiful sort of marriage between my work, um, what I was doing, and then the work that I did at the church. And so I began my journey before planting as a bivocational Pastor. So by the time it was time to uh, transition to doing it full time and getting on that cycle, the demographic that we grew was from North Minneapolis, which is where I lived and worked. And so we got the church started, and lots of people who I created um, partnerships with or uh, relationships will probably be a more appropriate word relationships with, um, as I worked there, they were some of the first to join and come to the church. And then eventually it was through those relationships that the church, um, began to grow. Uh, they would tell their friends about it. We stayed in the community and eventually we did make, uh, some geographic changes, staying as close to the city as we possibly could, um, because we wanted to meet in a school. And so we met at a school that was not very far from North Minneapolis. It was a a suburb that was adjacent um, to it. And it started with me doing work in the city, living 
in the city, um, making relationships in the city, which then transitioned uh, to more people telling folks about Blue Oaks. And we start meeting at a school in um, Brooklyn Center for anybody who's familiar with the area and just continue to grow from there. Nicole, you've also worked with a lot of ministry leaders over the years. What are some of the things that you're seeing with ministry and ministry leaders today? And how are you understanding leaders and some of the contextual challenges and opportunities that they're experiencing today? I'm going to answer that question. I did want to just rewind really quickly to Dwight's question about um, context and who we drew. I also want to say that we were purposely a church just not focused on urban missions, um, but also being a diverse congregation. It was very important to us that we were a picture here on earth of what the kingdom of heaven uh, looks like. Um, People from every tribe, every race, every color. And so we were really intentional about also wanting to build a community, a context in which people from different backgrounds, races, socioeconomic um, backgrounds were able to come and find community together. So it was a tall order, but I would say because we were so relationally relationally or relationship oriented, it worked um, well for us. Doesn't mean we didn't have hiccups, but it worked well for us. And so I just wanted to answer that. But Alicia, to answer your question about things that I'm noticing changing among leaderships in that context, I would say the biggest thing is actually the ability to set boundaries and have self-care. I think ministry now has pivoted to where many leaders are doing the heavy lifting. I know there's there's a saying in the church where it's, you know, 10% of the people doing 90% of the work. Well, if we just take that 10 just know that half of that 10 is the person that's over (laughs) the organization. And so what I notice now is that because there have been so many changes, um, given things like the pandemic and our world has just become so much broader and open, meaning people are working more easily remotely, able to move around a lot more easily than they were able to. It is much more complex and difficult to How do we have a group of people, a staff, or a group of leaders that are working with each other to help move an agenda or a mission forward together in person? And so in the day and age that we're in, given our mobility, given how things have expanded, given even our social media culture with um, influencers growing and that, that edge, it is is much more difficult to have a group or um, people, a community, a structure around you to help move things forward. And so I'm noticing even more than um, what I had when I was first starting ministry, that leaders really are pulling, pulling the load alone, pulling the load alone and feeling like there is no one um, to connect with. Does that make sense? Yeah, so Nicole, let's um, let's dig into that a little bit more because I suspect that many of our listeners and viewers will resonate with exactly what you're describing. They're feeling that burden, right? And, and I love that um, image of pulling the load. It just feels so heavy. Um, what would be your counsel to leaders who find themselves in that kind of situation? I think for me, the first order of self-care is to find um, someone who can help you carry the load. Um, even if that is a professional, get a spiritual director, get a therapist. I think sometimes we as leaders, we're so laser focused on the mission and the work that we forget that we can still be creative and tugging on other resources than the ones that are right in front of us. And so I find that it is very helpful to pull on a professional to help you carry the load if that group of people or that structure is not in place for you, it's okay to say, hey, let me employ a professional somewhere to help me carry this load. And I I think that's a first good step. 
But I think a good next step after that is establishing boundaries. There is so much talk in our culture now and um, in our society about trauma and healing and how do we deal with things and set boundaries so we're healthier people. And I do think that that is absolutely crucial. We must set boundaries with others. But before getting to a place where we set boundaries with others, I think it is absolutely imperative that we set boundaries with ourselves, that we say to ourselves, here is what I can do. Here's what I can't do. Here's what I know um, will lead me to a place of anxiety or uh, it may trigger some sort of trauma if I put myself in this situation. Here's what will lead me to burnout. And so I think it's so incredibly important that before we take the steps in establishing boundaries with others, if possible, because there are some there are some situations in which you may not have the opportunity to do your own personal assessment before carrying out boundary, boundaries with others. But if possible, to set those boundaries with yourself and to do your own work first. I know it is so tempting as pastors to do other people's work, right? There tends to be um, a savior complex out there. Amen. I know I'm not in mm-hmm. church, but I'm a preacher. <laughs> amen. So I say amen. Um, and that temptation is we want to help everybody else solve their problems see their problems. Um, but what does scripture say, right? Before we get the plank, you know, the splinter, I'm sorry, out of someone else's eye, we first have to do what? Remove the plank from our own. And so I think it's really important. Employ uh, a professional um, if possible and if needed, and then begin with self. Start doing some self-assessment and self-work first. Nicole, I'd love if you could share some about how um, the your own self-care and realization for um, boundaries and um, and recognizing your own need in figuring out a different way forward. Um, I'm curious if you could share some of the things maybe that um, from your own ministry and experience that helped you to see the value and importance of that. Well, not uh, only am I a minister, I'm also a mom. And for me, being a mom in that experience was the very beginning of me beginning to understand how important self-care and boundaries were. So when um, we began ministry, my husband and I, when we first got started, we did not have children. And uh, it was in the midst of the journey that we became adoptive parents. Um, And I remember... Our first, for any adoptive parent out there, you know, your story is usually unique. And we had an even more unique story as we were fostered to adopt parents, meaning we didn't have the time to prepare, if you will. There was no nine months. There was a call from a social worker and we ended up meeting and picking up our baby daughter on the same day. (laughs) We got the call. And so there was no room. Uh, to prepare. And I was so excited about being a parent and leading uh, that I didn't do a self-assessment and go, hey, perhaps I need to figure out how to delegate more to my team and to others. Instead, um, I was so, you know, tunnel vision focused that I would have my baby in a Moby. And um, how do I describe a Moby? Essentially, my baby was strapped to me while I'm leading meetings. And one Sunday, my baby was really upset and she just wouldn't go to children's church. And so I preached a whole message with my baby attached to me. Um, (laughs) And I thought to myself, in retrospect, this is crazy. This is crazy. Like, what, what am I doing? This is not sustainable. And, but I did not do the work I needed to do Beforehand, now this is all hindsight is twenty twenty, right? In the midst of it, you're doing the best you can and what you know. So I don't want anyone to feel condemned or judged. We do what we, you know, know in the moment, but when we know better, we do better. And it was in that moment that I began to say, "How am I going to balance motherhood 
and being a lead pastor. My Sunday mornings, I don't have a wife. I am the wife (laughs) and the mother. I am the one um, preparing my sermon, making sure my kids eat, and then styling their hair, you know, for church. How do I sustain and do all of this? And so I had to do work to invite people in to my circle. I had to um, put down this narrative that a more um, a woman who sacrifices is a woman who is successful. And I think in our society, um, the narrative of women tends to be in in black women um, tends to be the more we sacrifice, the more we're celebrated. The more we give up ourselves, the more we're celebrated. You're a really good mom. You're a really good woman when you do all these things. And so I had work around this really broken narrative that I had around womanhood and motherhood uh, that was completely imbalanced um, in as I walked in this way of doing ministry. And so part of me learning self-care, the catalyst, the real catalyst for that was motherhood. How do I do this um, without sacrificing my sanity and myself and still do this call that I have that God has called me to? Um, and to be honest, it took quite some time to find that balance. And I, I still am. And so I really speak from when I'm saying these things about, you know, get a professional to help you um, carry the load, um, do boundaries with yourself, delegate more things out. I'm saying it from a place of experience of going, wow, I really did a lot of sacrificing and stretching myself in ways that were really unhealthy. How would I change that now? What do I do now to make sure I'm a healthier leader in person? Well, so I'm curious on the the kind of the other side to that, which is um, expectations that a congregation may have of a leader. And how do you navigate, you know, either reframing those expectations or making them healthier or disappointing them at a rate people can stand, you know, those kinds of things? Um, I And I think this goes back to my setting boundaries with yourself and doing your own self-work. Not only do pastors tend to be folks who want to work on other people's problems, there's also a little bit of a savior complex, amen, um, where we want to save people and maybe hard to say no. Um, people pleasing may be the standard um, in which we have learned how to pastor that is the most acceptable thing. We want to help everyone. We want to be able to meet everyone's needs. And so for me, what I had to do and what I encourage many leaders to do is you do have to reframe the congregation's expectations. And then when you reframe it, be sure that someone will be disappointed. I, I've i never had uh, something happen where I've set a new boundary with a person that's had an expectation of me, including my congregation, where someone was not disappointed um, because they want access to you and your yeses the way they want it. And so I think uh, what's helpful is to say to that person or that group or your congregation, here is what this looks like. Um, We have, I've delegated uh, this piece out of pastoral care so you can have people to help you and walk with you. I've delegated perhaps a different piece out with Uh, some sort of ministry. Um, So other people will deal with it. And I think one of the ways that you can care for people, because I don't think people should be dismissed and disregarded just because they don't understand the concept of your boundary. I think that's an opportunity to teach, to say, hey, here's why these new boundaries are in place. Here's why we're reframing what this looks like, because I want to be a healthy leader. And here's what healthy leadership looks like. And I want you all to be healthy as well. And so you, I, I, I don't think it's good to just go, no, let me reframe it and deal with it, everyone. Um, but to use those moments as teaching opportunities uh, for everyone. Uh, but definitely it starts with reframing, being okay with disappointing people and just knowing that you're doing what's best uh, for you and ultimately your organization. 
Thank you, Nicole. I yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I really appreciate hearing hearing that. I'm also curious uh, when you look back, and maybe right, we can't look back uh, outside of the the frame of reference that we have today. Um, so it's really kind of looking forward in a way as well. Um, but what what would you say um, is something that you wish someone might have told you uh, about starting a new ministry um, earlier on in your ministry journey? I think I would say what I wish someone would have told me, there's only one you. Um, and you have to do your best to take care of you. I think at the end of the day, the congregations we serve are families that we love and serve as well. And even beyond that, beyond ministry, beyond home, whatever our other responsibilities and spaces are where we are. Um, invited and even required to show up. It is really imperative that we figure out ways to take care of ourselves. Um, Because once you hit a place of burnout where your mental health, um, emotional health, your physical health, and even perhaps relationships, very important relationships, um, get impacted by a lack of boundaries and a lack of healthy healthy self-assessment, we look up and it's too late and we're trying to do work um, that we should have been more proactive about in the beginning. And so I think I would say to my younger ministry self, Nicole, there is only one you. You can't do everything and you're not supposed to do everything. Take care of you um, and the things that bring you life that fill your cup, um, that keep you passionate about what you're doing because only you can control um, that. So um, one last question for you as we bring this to a close, and I just just wanna say like what you just shared is so important for our listeners to hear. And those of you who are listening or watching, um, let's sink in, I think those words, uh, and God's blessing over each of you as leaders. There is only one you. You're precious. <laughs> God has called you into this work, and it's so easy to lose sight of that. Um, but one last this question for you, um, Nicole. So um, you planted Blue Oaks Church. It had a life cycle. It was a new Christian community that was creative, and its life cycle got, of course, disrupted by COVID and, and came to an end. And that's that's very normal, I think, for church plants and just for the, for congregations for us to think about. What are a couple of key takeaways that you would want to share with our listeners and viewers around that whole journey and that experience? Um, I would say um, a couple of takeaways is one, normalize endings. Um, Endings are okay. Um, Endings happen in life. We all have a beginning. We all have an end, right? We look at our lives and we've all had cycles. And I think it's really important to normalize endings and not put too much emphasis on the ending, meaning sometimes we like to completely define our success according to um, how far we went versus the fact that we went at all. And I think um, redefining success to mean faithfulness and not productiveness I was, and don't get me wrong, I was very productive as a leader. And I thought in order to be more successful, I need to be more productive. But really, I just needed to be faithful to the thing that God had called me to do. And so I think the takeaways are let's normalize endings. They're okay. They're healthy. They're supposed to happen. And then two, let's define our success by the fact that we showed up, um, that we did the work, and that we were faithful to the call as we were in it. I love that wisdom, Nicole. And I can't help but think as we're closing, Nicole and I have, uh, we've known each other for, I actually think it's a couple decades at this point, Nicole. 
Does yes. it say how yes. we we yeah. we uh, met when we were like sixteen? So I'm just kidding. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we don't get it. We don't get it. Um, but we we tried a couple things that were like you know we were faithful. We responded, and you know they had their own life cycles, and um, and there was n- nothing wrong with with how long or short uh, those ministries or those experiments existed. Uh, It was just fun to be faithful together. Well, Nicole, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights and wisdom with us and our listeners today. Yes, thank you all for having me. Thanks again. (laughs) And to our audience, thank you for joining us on this episode of Pivot. To help spread the word about Pivot, please like and subscribe if you're watching us on YouTube or if you're listening, head to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. It really helps. And finally, the best compliment that you can give us is to share this episode and the Pivot Podcast with a friend. Until next time, Alicia Granholm and Dwight Shiley, we'll see you next week.